without further ado, uh, I uh, hand over the bait to Martin and I say hi, uh, Paul and Olivia. Uh, good to see you. Uh, so greetings to Sheffield or wherever you might be right now. And uh, now I, uh, I um, shut up. Okay. Udo, thank you very much. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Olivia. Morning. Hi, Martin. Hi, everyone. Hi, Olivia. Oh, it's so good to know you're there, Paul and Olivia. <laughs> Right, this this sort of theme that I, I we're talking about here for me goes back to 2012, when the European Commission said, "Tell us what are the barriers to the use of enterprise search in Europe." It was a time there were a lot of mergers and acquisitions of technology, and should Europe have its own enterprise search companies and things like this? The key thing that emerged was there aren't enough trained people to use search. There are no training courses. It's not recognized as an academic, I'm talking here of enterprise type search. It's not recognized as an academic subject. It's not taught in universities. And in 2012, it was very clear from quite a large scale survey that no one could find the people they wanted either inside the organization or to even to develop the technology. And here we are 10 years later, and I don't think the situation has changed. But you and Olivia, between you, I think you're going to give us some interesting perspectives on that. So this is a sort of duo presentation. And I know that, Paul, I'll let you handle it because you know when you want to bring Olivia in and whatever. So uh, you have you know, an hour to entertain us. <laughs> thank you, Martin, very much. And uh, thank you very much for inviting us to, to speak today. Um, so Martin gave us the topic. Uh, and said kind of talk about he said talk about barriers and talk about challenges and so on now he did go a little bit broader than information retrieval and he, he allowed us to talk about data science as well so um what we're going to do today is a kind of a two-part talk um so i'm going to start uh, just talking a little bit about um barriers uh, and crossing barriers and in particular i wanted just to focus on data science uh, and some of the experiences i've had both from myself transitioning to a career um, in industry, um, but also from the student perspective around some of the training that we've done and some of the courses that we've offered. Uh, Olivia's then going to um, kind of start, uh, uh, go, go after me, and she's going to talk a lot more about some of the barriers and crossing the barriers and boundaries she's faced from her perspective of coming into IR from a kind of psychology perspective. So we're going to try and give you sort of two different views. What we'd like to have is if there's time at the end, a bit of an open discussion, and maybe we can talk a little bit more about some of the barriers, the challenges in terms of maybe more um, kind of, you know, uh, search and providing uh, the workforce and the future workforce. So uh, let me just share my screen and hopefully, um, okay. Uh, so it says that I'm, um, I can't share my screen. Any, any reason for that, Martin? Um, I think I think the technical people behind <laughs> at the BCS are working on that, hopefully. Uh, wait, uh, so they made me host, uh, so let me just check whether... Um, okay, could you make me host and Olivia host? Uh, multiple, is it, well, uh, you should be able to do it now. It I've just shared, be... multiple people can share. Brilliant, I can, okay, yeah. I can do that now, perfect. Oh, great, okay. <laughs> great, uh, can everyone see my slides or not? Yeah. Yes. There, yes, we can. Well done. Great. Right, okay. Perfect. So, um, so Martin gave us the uh, the inspiration and the uh, the title for the talk um, when he introduced us to the notion of the 49th parallel. So I'll I'll tell you about that in a moment. So what we thought we'd do is just uh, sort of briefly talk about um, some of the boundaries that exist. Um, but what we really wanted to do is give you some you know practical examples of crossing boundaries. Uh, and I say, I'll do some of that, and then Olivia will do some of that, and then hopefully there'll be time for an open discussion uh, towards the end. Uh, so Martin introduced us to the idea uh, of the 49th parallel. Um, so this is an informal name for the US-Canada uh, border uh, that's delineated by a parallel line, uh, 49 uh, degrees north latitude. Uh, and I guess um, when reading around it, what's quite interesting about the notion is that it's come to represent uh, if you like, divides. So it's come to represent kind of geographic, cultural and political divides uh, between the two countries. And that sort of got us thinking about kind of the different worlds that can exist within information retrieval, uh, within uh, kind of data science and information science, and the sites are sort of boundaries uh, that you might have to cross. And that was the sort of inspiration for what we wanted to do today. So 
I'm sure you, you're all aware that there are plenty of boundaries and divides uh, within uh, both the fields of information science and data science. Um, you've got, uh, you know, obviously the industry uh, academic boundary uh, divide. Uh, you've got divides around different perspectives and disciplinary views um, on, say, search, on data science, on information science. Of course, you've also got kind of boundaries and divides around demographics uh, that can include things like digital divide, people sort of having uh, different experiences, different access uh, to data sets and information. For me, um, one of the sort of, I think, uh, over the over my career looking in thinking about divides one of the most obvious one that's kind of hit me i guess around search um, is is probably best highlighted by um peter and cow's book uh, the turn uh, which very much kind of sort of emphasized the i guess the different perspectives and the different camps that had grown up in search the algorithmic computational versus the more kind of cognitive human centered and the need to kind of embrace both and kind of cross those uh, boundaries and of course over the years there's been lots of great work done uh, to kind of cross the boundaries okay so um i'll do my bit i'm um, thinking about boundaries and crossing boundaries and i'm going to just focus on uh, data science uh, before uh, i do that i guess that i should say that the boundary that i'm going to try and focus on is the industry academia uh, boundary um there's lots of reasons for that partly it's personal uh, partly it's also from the kind of um, our, our perspective at Sheffield of trying to teach students that go from class into kind of, you know, um, industrial uh, commercial settings. Uh, of course, as you're fully aware, that there, there are very much divides in academia and industry driven by lots of different things. Um, you know, could be things like the intent, the motive, the need, um, you know, sort of the, the priorities, the requirements and so on. Um, but there have been lots of examples and there are lots of great examples of how you might cross that uh, boundary, either going from industry to academia or academia into industry. So sorts of kind of interactions I could think of would be things like, you know, collaborative research activities, um, things like um, education and training, maybe getting guest speakers in from industry, maybe developing problem based learning um, around real case studies, that type of thing. Uh, then you've got kind of other interactions like knowledge transfer. Uh, consultancy um, kind of type of uh, offerings. You've also got things like work placements and secondments. Um, at Sheffield, I've seen this quite a lot from, say, the medical department, where it's very common for staff to both have a, a position in the hospital together with a, a position uh, in a department, an academic department as well. But I think we're probably all aware that, you know, boundaries exist, but actually crossing uh, the boundaries can actually be very challenging, uh, can be very hard. So let me just talk about two examples of crossing uh, boundaries. I'll first of all mention my story. So this is an example of crossing boundaries between industry and academia, academia in, in kind of my, my own career. Uh, so it probably helps just to give you a very brief background in terms of examples, sort of boundaries that I've had to or tried to cross. Um, so I first of all started working in industry um, for BT uh, as, a, uh, as a 16 year old apprentice where I was mainly focused on electronics and software engineering. Um, I worked there for about 10 years or so. And then I moved uh, over uh, to university. So I went to work uh, for the University of Sheffield, beginning in the computer science department. And then I joined the information school in 2001, uh, where eventually I, I ended up uh, kind of uh, being an academic in the, in the information school. So that was an example, I guess, of going from industry and having to adapt to a kind of a, a university environment, which was very, very uh, different from what I was used to uh, working at BT. But more recently, um, I've kind of taken a, an, another boundary crossing uh, where I've gone from working full time at the University of Sheffield uh, to now working for a, a, a data and analytics consultancy company called uh, Peak Indicators. Uh, they're based in Chesterfield, which is in the Peak District, so not too far uh, from where I live. Uh, they're a relatively small company, about 45 people, and very, very focused traditionally on BI, um, business intelligence, data analytics, um, kind of you know, infrastructure for managing uh, data uh, and shifting uh, and lifting and shifting data. More recently, though, due to kind of client um, requests, they've uh, started to build up the data science and AI capability. So I've joined them to help them uh, with that kind of building up um, data science. So at the moment, I do uh, part time at uh, the University of Sheffield and then part time working in industry um, for peak indicators. 
But in terms of sort of the areas that I've worked in in, in um, kind of academia, um, I've definitely worked um, a lot in information retrieval, particularly around areas like multilingual search, uh, image search, and uh, geographic search. I've also um, always had an interest in data science and kind of AI, and more interested now in thinking about how you apply uh, some of those techniques in the more kind of industry commercial setting. In terms of what I do at Peak Indicators, um, it's various types of roles, but my focus is really about building up that data science capability, both internally, but also for clients as well. So some of the, what I do is to go in, kind of speak to clients about AI, machine learning technologies, about data, digital transformation, data transformation, data quality, and, and all those kinds of stuff. One of the other things that I'm doing recently as well is I've uh, been very interested in uh, ethics and particularly data ethics, AI ethics, uh, amongst other things. Uh, and recently I've joined um, what's called the Machine Intelligence Garage, which is a, a partly funded by Digital Catapult, where I'm one of the um, advisors under ethics. Uh, and what we're doing there is helping particularly startup companies um, to kind of navigate uh, ethics and thinking about kind of ethics, particularly to do with AI uh, and to do with data. So for me personally, if I was to think about my transitioning between, you know, sort of industry, uh, academia, uh, and then back to industry again, um, I kind of think my journey looks a bit like this, and this is how I'm hoping to, to plan out my journey. Uh, I kind of started uh, working around knowing about data science, and that was very much my work at Sheffield with training students, but it, it was very much focused in the classroom. Uh, I've then transitioned a bit more now to doing data science. So I am doing data science activities and work for clients, uh, building kind of data pipelines, um, doing some deployment of machine learning algorithms uh, and predictive models and so on. But where I'm interested in getting to, and this is partly why I'm doing the work on data ethics, while I'm also doing some work around uh, kind of data analytical transformation, is actually what does it take for an organisation to succeed and successfully adopt uh, data science and AI? So for me personally, that's that's been my journey and going from academia into industry is certainly helping me to kind of, you know, fill in the gaps, if you like, uh, for that particular um, journey. So what have been some of the challenges? Well, for those of you, you know, that uh, I know there's plenty here who have already had a go uh, at trying to sort of make that transition from industry academia or, or back to industry. Um, you'll know that there are, you know, lots and lots of challenges. I think for me personally, some of the challenges have been around Kind of where do you fit in so in peak you know to employ a professor where does a professor say you know actually fit in uh, to a kind of a business analytics or, or business um, kind of intelligence consultancy what do i do um you know i have plenty of kind of theoretical skills but hands-on skills you know i've had to do quite a lot of learning uh, and so i have done quite a lot around the uh, microsoft azure stack uh, and sharepoint and building things like power apps and stuff like that i think one of the other challenges i've found is uh, understanding business and developing business know-how uh, that is simple things like you know how the uh, how the balance sheet works um, how you organize teams how you sustain particularly when you're working for a consultancy company how you kind of you know deal with getting the work in and the sales the marketing uh, and all those areas other things I found quite challenging is because of limited time in uh, kind of academic work is trying to maintain some element of a you know academic and a research profile and I think the other thing that I've found really challenging is adapting, I think, to a different work ethos. So um, in, in academia, there's often a, a tendency to kind of work as much as you can. Uh, certainly at peak, the tendency is less and more to kind of, you know, uh, have a work, a better work life balance. OK, so that's one example of crossing boundaries. Let me just briefly give you another one uh, before I hand over to Olivia. Uh, so another example of crossing boundaries uh, between academia and industry is, is um, for our students at Sheffield. So in 2014, um, we started a, a master's in data science. Um, and it was a master's in data science at the time that was a little bit different to some of the other courses because we had more focus on a kind of a, an information school perspective. So uh, the, degree, the, the master's was sort of very much focused around the, the areas such as people, uh, use of data science, context, uh, and responsible use and uh, kind of societal impact. Uh, it, the course started quite small with 20 students and has now risen to around 148 students. And over the years, what we've managed to do, and it's been a, you know, something that we've, we've tried to do, but it's not always easy, is try to get a kind of a, a good diversity of students. 
So we've all, always had a very good uh, uh, equal gender balance, which has been great introducing women particularly into kind of uh, data science and IT. Uh, we've also had very good ethnic ethnicity kind of balance as well. And uh, what we've found in the program is that a lot of students are equipped uh, with the skills that they need and the knowledge to go into a range of data related roles, not always data science roles, might be data analyst roles, might be more strategic roles. Um, but certainly um, many, many of the students uh, are, are, are employable at the end. The sorts of things that people uh, are taught, the types of uh, things that we're taught, um, we started very much with sort of, um, yeah, um, thinking I think more technical. Uh, and over time, we very much uh, introduced a lot more of the kind of social sciences uh, elements, if you like, in terms of how we frame data science, how we think about data science and how we teach data science. Uh, a lot of what we've been uh, kind of thinking about in terms of teaching has also been um, kind of driven by some of the, the sort of guidance from government and say uh, the likes of the Royal Society uh, and their reports and that as well. Uh, as well as also talking to industry uh, about what types of skills are they requiring from students going into kind of a data analytical or data science type of role. Um, there, there have been many, many challenges um, that we've found in terms of trying to equip students that can go from the classroom into a kind of uh, a kind of industrial uh, setting, as many are in the room or in the, the, the core hill know when you're trying to teach students kind of how they can sort of move into a, a commercial setting. Uh, and what have been some of the needs? So Martin asked me to also think about uh, and reflect about what are some of the needs that we look for as a company in terms of the types of students that we want to employ. Certainly one of the areas would be around soft skills. I think often they are seen as perhaps less important, um, but they are incredibly important. Uh, things like teamwork, communication, critical thinking and, and so on. Uh, so we've been working really hard at thinking about how we equip and, and train up our students with those softer skills. Uh, one of the other challenges we've had as a, as a program is we're a master's degree or we've been running as a master's degree in a social science faculty uh, information school uh, with you know, no requirements into the types of students that we have. We don't specify a particular background. Students just have to be willing to get stuck into kind of, you know, um, handling data and, and working with data. So that's been a real challenge about how do you take people with very different backgrounds? Some might come with computer science skills, many don't. Uh, some come from an arts background, for example, but want to get into kind of analytics and data science. <clears throat> so thinking about, you know, how we uh, kind of train those students and how we sort of, you know, uh, the level, if you like, at which we train them has been a real challenge for us. And it's a challenge for the students as well. Uh, the other things that we found challenging are teaching the right skills to equip students to do data science. So, for example, teaching things like project management skills, the use of version control, Git, um, the use of kind of, you know, uh, agile and, and those types of things as well. The types of ways of working that they're going to find in practice, but not necessarily something that's easy for us to teach uh, in the classroom. And I guess the other thing that we've found very challenging <clears throat> is um, kind of helping students sort of uh, understand how to apply data science, you know, in context and in kind of real life cases. I think for us, that's a real challenge, you know, how you apply data science and analytical techniques to a, a business problem. And that's been recognised recently at where I don't know if you've seen this kind of fairly new role that's come up, the idea of a kind of data or an analytics translator, somebody who can translate between the business and the business need and the, understand the business versus the kind of, you know, what machine learning, data science and AI can offer and making that kind of translation. We have ourselves kind of explored some of these issues and we wrote a, a paper at the FAT conference a, few, a couple of years ago now, where we were very much looking at how do you introduce fate uh, and critical data studies. So that's fairness, accountability, transparency and ethics into the curriculum, which we've you know, always found actually a very challenging uh, thing to be doing. Uh, so Martin said to me also to reflect. So um, I guess if I had the opportunity to help design the program again, what would I do? Um, well, actually, I have had the opportunity to do that um, because um, we were asked by the university to set up and run or, or to put together a proposal for a BSc, an undergraduate degree in data science. And so actually what we've done is try to learn from uh, our kind of, you know, teaching on the master's program to then applying this um, in the undergraduate program. And some of the guess, I guess, things that I've taken away from that and that hopefully we're going to be building into the program uh, would be things like focusing a lot more on centering the course around things like data and the data science life cycle, focusing very much more on context and context of use, for example. So, uh, you know, thinking about ethics, you know, in some contexts, in some area, you know, aspects, ethics might be fine. 
uh, it might be okay. In some, some other contexts, it might not be okay. Uh, we're also going to be doing a lot more around kind of providing uh, AI and ML and Python content, which we know is something that, um, you know, employers have been asking for. But also what we're uh, going to be trying to do is a bit more around data wrangling, which we feel is an area that perhaps is a little bit lacking um, from our master's program and potentially other programs as well. So that is kind of, you know, actually dealing with real data sets, realistic data sets and doing a lot more around things like thinking about features and feature engineering. What we're also trying to introduce is a little bit more around project management, ways of working, so things like JIRA, Agile and so on. Um, but key for us is that uh, topics like ethics, sustainability, diversity, they're embedded now within the program aims, so they're embedded in all the modules that we're offering as well. So rather than ethics being an add-on, which perhaps it's been seen to be in the past, is actually now driving uh, the way that we're going to teach and deliver data science. The other, I guess, novelty or aspect that we're focusing on is using a more project based or inquiry based learning approach, uh, which will enable students to kind of, you know, hopefully practice uh, what they're learning. Uh, so that's all I'm going to uh, say about my side of it. I'm going to hand over now to um, uh, Olivia, uh, who's going to talk a bit about crossing boundaries from her perspective. Sorry, I just need to. Olivia, you're able to share, okay? Um, it looks like you're still sharing. Oh, sorry. Let me just get rid of that. Okay. Um, stop sharing. Sorry. Okay, stop share. Sorry, Olivia. There you go. No worries. Let's take it over to a different screen now. <laughs> Brilliant. So can everyone see this, my slide? Yeah, yeah, fine. Thank you, Olivia. Brilliant. Um, okay, so hello, everybody. Um, I'm Olivia, and I am a third year industrial PhD student, and that is mainly focusing on information retrieval. And it's with the University of Strathclyde, but it is also sponsored by BAE Systems. There's a lot of collaboration um, working between academia and industry there. But then as well as that, uh, the other side of me is I'm also a psychology lecturer and, and that's with the Open University. And so today I'm going to give you a broad overview of how I've merged these two fields together. And I'm gonna give um, an example of like my own experience, how, how it came about. But then I'm also going to provide some mini case studies to really emphasize how important it is to be multidisciplinary when considering IR, information retrieval. So I wanted to start with these photographs I took um, because photography represents my passion. And that is how does our perception work in relation to what we see? Now, perceiving photographs can be enjoyable but if you're completing a specific search task, then how you perceive things starts to become really important. And people nowadays are completing search tasks all the time. These range from the everyday activities, such as the online browsing or shopping, learning or working. But then at an industrial level, the outcome of retrieving the right kind of information can mean the difference between life and death. Now, Unfortunately, human brains are cognitively limited. We just cannot process everything we see. Now, my fascination for understanding this limited perception began in my undergraduate psychology degree. I was reading many books and textbooks and journals and conference papers, and I'm sure everyone here is familiar with this task. As I was reading and trying to learn, I was thinking, why am I following the words with my mouse cursor? Why, when I read textbooks, am I running my finger or a pen along each line? Now, simultaneously, I often played a game with my nieces called Where's Wally? Now, for those who are unfamiliar, the aim is to find the man in the red striped jumper against a lot of other distracting stimuli. Now, in this game, I'd also be using my finger to scan around the image, trying to find the target. So it got me thinking, what is it that makes finding Wally so difficult? And after a lot of reading, I came across the concept of clutter. 
Now, there's many definitions of clutter, and this is in lots of different disciplines from neuroscience to marketing, and it's also sometimes referred to as crowding. But basically, clutter occurs when too much visual stimuli overloads human cognitive capacity. And this leads to this like bottleneck in object perception. And so I wondered, was the simple task of just reading creating clutter? Because so many words surround other words. But when I looked into the previous literature, a recent review described how research involving clutter in psychology has focused on stimuli such as digits, objects, abstract symbols, and natural scenes. And the general finding from all of these studies is that people's accuracy of finding what they're looking for reduces when more clutter is visible, and they take a lot longer. But these are really artificial scenes. For example, in one experiment, participants were instructed to search for the letter T against lots of um, clutter of letter L's. So in parallel with this quite artificial research that was happening in psychology, um, we have technology and it's constantly evolving. And more and more people are owning digital devices and apps have been designed that offer new ways to read. So for example, shown here is an app where instead of reading words in sentences and paragraphs all at once, each word is individually presented one by one, like so. Now this is called rapid serial visual presentation. And research has found, that even though you can see less words on the screen at any one time, people still read faster overall with one study saying over a thousand words can be read in a minute using RSVP, compared to another study saying, you know, just about 300 words can be read in normal reading. And so at first glance, it would appear that these apps show less clutter, but no research has actually examined whether these apps reduce the clutter scientifically. But most importantly for the user, it is unknown whether people are able to retain the information that they have just read through this format of presentation. So straight away, we have our first example of the divide between psychology and IR. People are making more and more advanced software, and they usually design it with the aim of showing off how good they are at making a new cool piece of technology. But is it actually designed with the user in mind to make sure that they are retrieving the information effectively? or vice versa, can we use technology to help users learn better? So consequently, I designed an experiment to test whether reading and learning a word surrounded by other words would result in people taking longer to process the information and then whether they would actually retain it later on. So participants were given conditions and they had to remember a target word and pictured here is the no clutter condition where the target word is in isolation. But then there were also uh, a clutter condition where there would be lots of distracting words around the target, but participants were told only focus and remember the target word. Now, I also used a clutter non-word condition and that gives the illusion of clutter, but it acts less so on like the technology and the semantics of reading. Now for each condition, there were 10 target words to remember, and then there was a recognition task and participants were shown a list of words and asked, you know, had this been a target or not? Yes or no. So this created two dependent variables. And this was uh, firstly the average reaction time in it, that it took them to make a decision. And then secondly, the number of correctly identified target words. Now, statistical analysis revealed significant differences for both of these independent dependent variables. So when no clutter was present, participants were much faster in their reaction times and making a decision. And they also did learn and remember significantly more. And there were no significant differences between either forms of clutter. So overall, these results are consistent with theories which state that when there's clutter, this degrades accuracy and response times. But this took it beyond just abstract stimuli and into a more real scenario, which is reading. And so this further amplifies how limited our brains can be when we have too much in our visual field. But these results are not just theoretical. They can have vital importance in so many aspects of everyday life to challenge how best to present information. 
So for example, it might be a more optimal reading environment if people learn using apps that reduce clutter, such as the ones that use RSVP, where you only see one word at a time. But this is where we need to stop and think. If the simple act of just reading is creating clutter, then how many other elements of visual information can act as clutter? And especially this is important in the everyday technology that is constantly evolving and that we're all using. So during my PhD, I focused explicitly on information retrieval. And I noticed that on almost every website, adverts are literally everywhere. And they're constantly competing for a user's attention. Now, while digital ad spending is many billions, all of this research is focused on just user engagement and memory for the ad. No one has actually studied whether ads are also clutter and impacting a user's search in terms of their performance or their time or their general experience. And so it's again the same example of creating technology but not considering how it affects the user. So to understand how ads actually affect users, I created another experiment and participants completed four search tasks from one of the Trek test collections. And so they were given a topic and asked to find relevant documents like here. And um, this allowed a variety of metrics to be gathered uh, to assess the search behavior and performance. Now, in one condition, no advertisements were visible like here. But then the other free search tasks did have different types of ads visible and they were positioned in locations shown here. But what I did is the metrics gathered for all of these conditions, I averaged the ones from all of the different ads to just create one measure of overall ads or overall clutter and then compared this to the no clutter or no ads. And again, statistical analysis revealed significant results. So firstly, participants did take almost a minute longer completing the search task when ads were present compared to absent. But then also when no ads were visible, participants were much faster in making a decision and saving their first relevant document. And they took only 66 seconds compared to about 88 seconds when ads were present. And then also beyond just behavior, looking at post-task accuracy, and this considered how much people could remember that they had just searched for. This again showed a significantly better performance for users in no ads who retrieved an entire extra concept compared to users who are learning information among searches with ads. And then as well as behavior and performance, there were also significant differences in terms of experience. So when no ads were visible, negative feelings occurred. Participants, sorry, positive experiences occurred for the no ads. You know, participants thought it was easier to, learn, to complete. They learned more, they were more satisfied. But then when the ads were present, they were more frustrated. They, were, they, were, they thought it was more annoying and they didn't enjoy it as much. So again, we have another example of the psychological phenomenon of visual clutter. And yet technology, it's evolving. It's making more and more advanced adverts and creating more and more clutter. And this ranges from animations to interactive games, and they keep popping up everywhere and it's so visually overwhelming. But this is negatively affecting the user hugely. And so why are more people not investigating this? We keep adding to our equipment, adding layers of information to process for additional screens and programs and buttons to press, but can a user keep up with this psychologically? Now, furthermore, there's another huge aspect of all of this to consider, and that is individual differences in visual perception. So some people will be nat naturally better able to process what they see. And there's many individual differences to consider, and these range from dyslexia to cerebral visual impairment to simply the act of just being tired. But one individual difference in particular is perceptual speed. And this is what I've also really focused my work on because everybody can have a perceptual speed level. Now, specifically, this is a type of cognitive ability and it involves how well someone can process what they see. But in information retrieval, studies have found that it affects many aspects of a user's search experience and performance. 
So for example, people with low perceptual speed, they report higher workload, and then they have a greater difficulty achieving their search goal. In comparison, high perceptual speed users are the opposite. They are more satisfied, and then they're more time efficient and also accurate in their search tasks. And so with such strong effects, this really highlights how important it is to be aware of. So for example, if someone develops a low perceptual speed, how can we make sure that information retrieval accommodates them? Can we detect a user's level automatically from their search behavior? A recent paper of mine using machine learning shows promising accuracy at doing this, but then we need to take it beyond this and we need to design interactive and dynamic interfaces that say, yes, this person's perception is just decreased, but how can we help them? Do different interfaces help? Or can we present a warning so that if they're completing an industrial task, you know, such as a submarine operator, they know it's time for a break if their perception drops. And so all of these questions, again, reinforce the need for merging psychology and information retrieval together. However, when analyzing all previous papers that considered perceptual speed in information retrieval, I identified many limitations with the fundamental tests of perceptual speed. And these all involve how um, the actual content of the test, how they've been administered, analyzed, and then how results have been disseminated. And I wrote all of these papers, uh, all of these problems into a paper. And this actually won the best paper award at CHEER, uh, the conference last year. Now, I don't have time to go into all of these details, but the point I really wanted to make for the purpose of this talk is that this is an example of how psychology has tried to be incorporated into IR, but it's failed. Because I've identified that there are huge problems with the reliability and validity of these tests. And I just don't understand how the peer reviewing process hasn't picked these up before. So it makes me wonder, is this an example of, say, a computer scientist not knowing how to assess a test that fundamentally tests a psychological construct? And so when merging fields together, how can we make sure that researchers have a strong foundation in both areas when people usually only train in one? Now, finally, I want to give, continue that thought and um, also one that is echoing Paul's talk uh, about the divide between the training in academia and then transferring this into industry. And I just want to provide a final example, which is very topical to everyone here, and that's obviously COVID. Now, during the summer, I crossed more boundaries and I undertook a, a research project with the Scottish government. And that was specifically focusing on COVID. Now, while I wasn't doing a project that was directly related to my PhD, I saw so many crossovers and I believe that what I saw there strengthens the theme of this talk. And that is what I've been saying about is designing technology for optimal information retrieval. Is this happening, but without actually considering the user? And in this context, I'm focusing on healthcare. So to be more specific, I'm going to assume that most people here will have seen a GP at some point, or if you're not familiar with that term, a primary care medical professional. And so if we compare GPs now to being, doctor, to being a doctor less than 100 years ago, it's very different. So before antibiotics were discovered, doctors only had a few treatments that they could administer, and they thought that they were able to know everything possible that they could do. Whereas now, there are over 24,000 prescriptions and over-the-counter medications available. And then when a GP actually puts into their computer system a reason for the consultation, there's around 350,000 different concepts in the catalogue that they can choose from. So thankfully, it appears that we've become more sophisticated in our knowledge. But it comes at a cost. Because as I've shown you today, the more information that's present, the harder it is for our brains to process. And physically speaking, it's just not possible for any one person to know every single prescription or illness available. But alarmingly, doctors aren't actually trained to use these computer systems we have. And they're not even told like how to accurately record certain codes. 
For example, we have these catalogues of codes available, but how should someone actually navigate this list efficiently and effectively? Do individual differences in GPs' perception need to be monitored or trained to make sure that they're actually able to filter out the information properly? And so ultimately, this is just another example of how we're designing a system for information retrieval, but then we have actually no idea of if it's user-friendly, and this can have really dangerous consequences because what we were seeing is that if long COVID is not catalogued consistently, obviously this is a new term, we can't identify who it's actually affecting most or how to treat it. And so to conclude this presentation, how can we make sure that we as users of information in any domain can actually process what we see? How can we guarantee that as software and technology evolves, the user can actually keep up with it. We can't all be trained in everything. And so instead, we need to remove the borders. And we need to focus on being multidisciplinary. We need to build connections. We need to ensure that we gain advice from people with different skills and abilities to make sure that the user of whatever application they're considering is put first. So whether that's in learning or navigating online websites or performing industrial roles or finding medical information. And so to finish, I pose the question to you. How can we make sure that this multidisciplinary way of thinking happens? And so that concludes my presentation for today. And I thank you very much for listening and especially to Martin for giving me this opportunity to present today and to Paul for kind of co-collaborating. And so, yeah, if you have any questions, we're, we're happy to now take them. And alternatively, please feel free to contact me um, at any time. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much you indeed very to both of you. Yeah. yeah. Andrew, you have a question. Yes. Um, well, it's, it's maybe it's, a, it's, a, it's an observation. It might turn into a question, but there's, there's an elephant in the room here that, um, Paul, you, you were an external examiner for information systems and technology. That's gone. The business systems analysis and design course at City has gone. Mm. Uh, so all of the, uh, and this is happening generally, by the way, the information systems management degree at uh, Brunel has gone away. Uh, um, there, there is a massive change, not just in, 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 in the commercial world, but in, in academia, uh, uh, we just can't recruit students into those programs, information systems, business pro systems programs anymore. Everybody's rushing towards data science. Mm. The problem is my information knowledge management module, which I used to teach to teach people more about the, the software, you know, the organizations, information uh, uh, use, all that kind of thing has gone. Mm. So student, a lot of, uh, and this, this is happening for various reasons, so there's a disconnect, a big disconnect happening, unfortunately, between uh, uh, um, what we're delivering and what the students need. But it's also, unfortunately, paradoxically being driven by students who are rushing to data science when actually they still need. And we've been told this. We had a guy who works in data science. We need uh, people in with, with those soft skills. What do we do? Uh, uh, to bring this back back to, together again, because eventually there's going to be a, 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 it's going to come to the point where we've got people, you know, they've got fantastic machine learning skills, they've got fantastic visualization skills, but as uh, uh, as Olivia illustrated wonderfully, that, 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 that we, we we haven't got the necessary skills to do things that we need to do in in, in very important areas. What do we do about it is the question, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Good question. Good question, Andy. Um, I think one of the things I've noticed maybe in um, certainly in the industry is, I don't know, years ago we had this kind of view of data science being the kind of unicorn. It was somebody who did everything. And certainly when I look at jobs and stuff like that as well, what I'm noticing is that the jobs are becoming perhaps a little bit more specific. So you've got like the ML ops person who's more focused on deployment and predictive models into the, the kind of system. You've got people maybe who are more on the data analysis side, other people who are perhaps more on the kind of, you know, softer side and so on. 
So I don't know whether in response we need to, rather than create a course that covers everything, need to be a bit more specific in terms of trying to capture courses that meet the roles that are emerging uh, in industry. Um, this role of data translator, analytics translator is an interesting one because it tries to balance understanding the business, understanding the needs of business and how businesses work together with kind of what technology, AI, machine learning and app can provide. But part of the problem there though, is that that partly relies on you having like experience in a particular organization uh, and so on, which how do you teach that in the classroom? It's, it's kind of, that's probably a better type of course that would be a kind of a lifelong learning course or maybe a professional development course or something like that. Um, yeah, I don't know, Andy, I think it's really hard. And I think that that kind of, you know, different disciplines trying to come together. I've seen some universities where the business school teams up with the computer science department teams yes. up with the information school and everybody teaches a bit but i still don't know whether we're trying to kind of teach too much and actually at some point you've probably got to choose a view and your own definition yeah. and view of data science and run with it if you want to make a career of it um or, i don't know or, or if, if 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 you're a if you're a, a company build multidisciplinary teams with a yeah i noticed that information system management in business schools it is still there but it's a very, very different curricula to what uh, mm. you get in computing and information science. In fact, we, we couldn't teach it. We mm. couldn't, it's a business school thing. So yeah. maybe that's the way around it. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, there's a question for Olivia from Aaron de Vries. Olivia, can you see that in the chat window or shall I read it out for you? Um, let me just open the chat. Okay, so do you think the effect of ads would be similar to that of showing information from the knowledge graph and or other search verticals, or would that be less impactful on search performance because results are still somehow related to the information need or they would not surface? Um, I have to say I don't know what a knowledge graph is, so that doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's probably the, the, the merging disciplines. It's like actually just following up from the last point, what, what I found quite interesting is my undergrad was psychology and neuroscience. And then I came into a computer science department and I also wanted to teach, but there were no courses that I was qualified to teach. And so I had to go to a different institution to actually you know, get teaching experience um, because they're not they're just not merging together enough it's it's not as it's not as seamless um but anyway yeah sorry going back to the effective ads okay well uh, a comment i've recently been involved with studying on users of aphasia and clutter was oh yeah of course so yeah no okay so clutter is a problem everywhere and so i don't as i said i don't really know what the details of what a knowledge graph is but i'm going to assume it's some kind of again additional element of information uh, maybe nod or I'll shake your head and go no be completely wrong um, and so, yeah, what I'm finding is clutter can really be anything. And so I've also seen links to say things like blended interfaces or the more verticals that you're adding into a system, it is creating negative effects. So like there's a study talking about like uh, people with low perceptual speed and um, adding more and more verticals to the page. And it's saying, you know, this is negative. Like people, people who struggle with their perception, they, they are overwhelmed in these things. And so, yeah, I would say that, um, the effect would probably be similar to whatever the element of visual information is. Except something that I'm working on right now is working out, well, can the actual information present be tailored to actually help? So, you know, is it all clutter, bad clutter, or can there be good clutter depending on the type of clutter, you know? If it is relevant to the task at hand, can it help you? Um, and so there's just, there's so much work to be done in this area. Yeah, uh, Michael Upshaw has asked you, Olivia, have you done any work on clutter within text? In other words, what is it that makes text itself readable apart from fonts and things like this? I yeah. mean, I, and I'm thinking of, you know, you get inserts of footnotes and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, so the bit I've done on that is about, it's called interletter spacing. And so it's talking about like, even if you look individually at a word and how closely the letters are positioned together. So whether you've got all the letters completely condensed and that is showing more clutter versus when you have the, I guess, more usable fonts, like, you know, the typical ones that are suggested for use of say dyslexia, they are slightly more space. They have that, like that, that white space around them. 
um, and that that also helps uh, processing again more accurate uh, responses and actually identifying uh, able to retain it better and able to read faster. Thank you, Paul. Can I can I ask you a question? Um, sure. And I have an interest here because because we had great fun in 2014 developing that data science course. Mm. But uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm a visiting professor at the, at the I school, which means that I visit but I don't get paid. Uh, <laughs> Um, Paul, one of the things that we discussed quite often was the extent to which the courses in the iSchool were technology or rather product neutral, hmm. and whether we should be teaching our students how to use SharePoint, because when they go into industry, the dominant application they will get will be SharePoint, and there are other specialised ones, stats packages and stuff like that. Has your view on the, on the value of actually having real products available to students changed as a result of your experience? Um, it's a good question, Martin. Um, and I think there's a balance there, isn't there, between kind of being vendor agnostic, so that you don't just tie into the latest technology that in one year, two years time, you know, is out of date and stuff, but also keeping up to date with, with kind of things. So in the master's programme, we did teach various technologies like um, SPSS we were using for stats, we were using kind of Tableau for some of the visualisation, Nine for data mining, that type of stuff. I think what we're doing in the undergrad, the new undergraduate though, is that we're going to probably focus more on the Azure stack, the Microsoft stack. And part of the reason for that is that we've, well, I've certainly seen that most of our customers now are AWS, well, the cloud-based AWS versus, you know, sort of Google or versus Azure. And there's definitely a focus, particularly from the more business end, to be using Azure. Azure also is quite accessible, I think, for students and enables them to teach things like if we want to show a student how do you deploy a model to an endpoint, that is something that we can do relatively easily uh, using Azure. So my view would be actually you're always being right martin um we should have probably always had a course where we were teaching sharepoint it's you know it was a dominant technology if we could employ somebody who fits straight in being able to kind of be familiar with azure and use azure that that's even better for us although it's not mandatory because we can teach that um so i yeah i do think that my view is that it's helpful to probably have at least one or two dominant technologies and i would say if nothing else teach cloud-based technologies and teach students the, yeah. the benefit and the value of cloud because most industry now is a lot of it is cloud-based um, yeah okay Udo, oh, Udo's got his hand up again um uh yeah uh, Udo and then I've got a question from Mahmoud uh here's my hand uh, um <laughs> yeah no actually uh initially it was a follow-up comment to what Andy uh said about the uh, courses but now I realize it also fits in nicely with what you just said um, some of it uh, actually has to do with uh, how you label these courses. So uh, Andy mentioned uh, uh, sort of his role as external examiner. Now I come in as external examiner of the MSc in data science at Sheffield. <laughs> and, uh, and you look at it and uh, to me, it doesn't look like your usual MSc in data science uh, because uh, like Paul mentioned earlier, so you have uh, social science aspects, you have, uh, uh, you have, uh, a different take on it and uh, it's called data science but it's very much like the the, the sort of courses that andy uh, was uh, uh, talking about information management and so on and i remember uh, uh, trying to set up an msc in information management and i think it was andy or maybe ian russell who said don't do it because what you get is you get all these people who uh, want to do management uh, so you get all these management uh, uh, students that have nothing to do and no interest in computer science uh, yeah. So we didn't. So we called it in the end MSc in big data and text analytics, uh, which which were fine. Uh, but yeah, I think some of it has to do with just uh, uh, using the right label. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, Olivia, there's another question for you from Mahmoud Artimi about how you actually measured user attention in your. Uh, experiments? Was it done with sensors or eye trackers or whatever? Could you perhaps just expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so the, this is, I always wanted to use eye tracking and I did all of the training and I was learning how to use all of the equipment and then COVID happened. Um, and so I was unable to actually use eye tracking, but then we switched it up and I read a lot of studies, which basically was correlating that where your eyes are fixating and um, it's basically the same as, not exact, but close enough to just where your mouse is hovering. So we made sure I tracked like mouse movements. But then also what I was really um, 
made sure I focused on is the fact that even if, say, I had used eye tracking and said, well, yes, the user is fixating at this point, it's not just about where you look. Um, the whole actual as um, concept of clutter is that it's your peripheral vision. So even if you're not directly looking at it, it's like what's in the background that is still somehow distracting you. Um, and so, yeah, that's the answer, basically. Okay. Thank you very much. Can I remind everyone that at the end of this conference, you have to have to decide who's given the best presentation, um, so the, that you get a little framed print. So, so congratulations. Those have been two brilliant presentations. Paul and Oliver, Olivia, thank you very much indeed. Um, I see perception in a totally different way, thinking of transdisciplinary, because I'm a church organist. And organists tend to have to have a huge repertoire because we play so many different organs in so many different ways. So we are very choosy about how the music score is presented to us. It might not be, you know, some people like in a particular layer because we want to be able to quickly be able to sight read music. And I don't know whether you've looked at it, but there's a huge amount of work that has been done on how people sight read music and how their perceptions of music change depending on what the score looks like. Can I just add on to that very quickly mm. um, and say that this is something I've talked with many professors and actual med, uh, doctors um, about people with cerebral visual impairment, which is people who um, struggle processing what they see, but it's, there's nothing wrong with their eyes. It's about the connections in their brain. And there's these differences between if you're actually reading music that um, if you're a pianist and your music's right in front of you, then they have no issues of seeing it because it's right in front of them. However, if you're a violinist and your music is, you know, at an arm's length, yeah. then you're not just seeing your music, but also seeing all of the background clutter. And so all of that's also affecting you, which I think is fascinating. Oh, we have so much to learn about this. I think you have a good career ahead of you. So Paul and Olivia, again, thank you very much indeed. Very much. Um, a great contribution.